show is that really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, gen uh, friend, uh, friends and colleagues, uh, I, uh, I'm, Wu, I'm Wilson Lam from uh, from the Hong Kong Institute of Art of Art and Trade, uh, and and to, and today is our uh, is our great uh, is our great honor uh, honor to, uh, to, uh, to today to uh, to co uh, to co organize this uh, how to how to use NEC for in build uh, in build, uh, in building works uh, sem uh, sem seminar with the construction industry council. The School of Professional uh, Professional Certificate Certification in Construction, as uh, as well as as NEC Asia, uh, and then I would uh, I, uh, I, ju uh, I just wish to say we are uh, we are honored to uh, to uh, to have very to have two very good speakers to today. The, uh, the first is Rob uh, is Robert, uh, and I, uh, and I think you all have uh, had met him in. Uh, in many and in many NEC pro, uh, projects and NEC sem, uh, seminars, uh, and uh, and the other one uh, on my side is uh, is Mr. Vin, uh, Vincent Lee, uh, uh, and uh, and our first speaker Rob, uh, Rob he uh, he is the C, he is the senior NEC consultant and uh, and 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 NEC U user group sec. Uh, secretary in Hong Kong, and he has 35 years uh, experience in uh, in, set, in setting up and, ma and managing co contracts with with at least 20, 25 years in uh, in uh, in NEC co contracts, and he is very experienced in N in NEC three in uh, in NEC four, uh, and uh, and how uh, and he is the joint author of NEC four in avoiding and uh, and resolving disputes. And uh, NEC four in, pra in practical solutions and, and, and NEC three practical solutions. And in addition, he, he is an accredited me uh, mediator and a dispute res uh, resolution advisor DRA. Uh, and uh, and another speaker uh, on uh, on my side is my friend, which is uh, who uh, who, uh, who is Mr. Vin, uh, Vincent Lee. Uh, he uh, he is a professional c uh, civil engineer in background, and he is also uh, and he is also a, pra a practicing Bear, uh, bear, uh, barrister, and in that, in addition, he is an N N N E C four E C C accredited P M, uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, and he is all and he is also very not, uh, knowledgeable uh, in alternative this uh, this will rest uh, resolution uh, as uh, as well as an uh, as an N N E C advisor, and right now I just leave the time. Uh, to our to our first very dis very distinguished speaker, Rob, uh, Rob, uh, Robert. Okay, thank you, sir. That's brilliant. Good job. Yeah, here. Okay. Right, there you go. Easy. Yeah. Okay, thank you again. Uh, uh, great introduction. Uh, I understand there's 1,800 people who've subscribed to this, so that is fantastic. Isn't yeah. It? The, certainly the largest number of people on the webinar that I've been involved with. So. Next challenge is to convert that to charitable income. But yeah, beat the record each yeah. time and get some charitable income. So, so this is about using NEC four for for building projects. Um, now, now the NEC guys do say that NEC is not biased to any one sector. Anyone, no, no one country, no one jurisdiction, no one sector. So the same processes apply whether you're using the NEC contract for oil and gas, petrochemical, building, or civil engineering. There's no real um, uh, difference, I don't think. So, what one? Uh, it's a fairly pro provocative title, isn't it, or, or a challenge in this webinar? What, what what is the problem with using NEC for buildings? Why is it not used for buildings as prolific, prolifically as it is for for civil engineering? It is used for a considerable amount, but it is a little bit slower. So maybe let's try and unpick why that is. Um, I think that we get wrong. One, one thing that we get wrong in uh, in most sectors, including building. It's just deciding to use a form of contract. So I'm not going to sit here and say you should use NEC for all of your contracts. So I think you should use NEC because it's the right contract for your particular project. And that, and that actually is about the fifth thing that you should do. So when deciding which contract to use, about number five is to pick the form of contract the best suits the above the above bullet. So let me explain what, what I mean a little bit more. And I've actually stolen this from from. Uh, John Broom, he wrote a book, Procurement Reach for Partnering, something like that. Very, really good book with a really good process for deciding the right form of contracts. 
we automatically use FIDIC or GCC or NEC. I don't think that's right. I think you should use it for the right reasons. And the right reasons are, first of all, to think of the project itself and the risks that surround it. Understand what it is you're actually trying to achieve with the project and what are the threats, if you like, that may jeopardize a successful outcome. Uh, then go on to choose the most appropriate procurement route, which could be uh, design and build, uh, client design, PFI, PPP, if you really do that, that sort of thing. Pick the procurement route you think is best place to deliver the, the uh, project. Then look at the contract strategy. You may want uh, ECI, you may want two-stage tendering, you might single stage, negotiated, competitive bidding. So, so we incrementally decide what to do at the next step. Um, once you pick the appropriate contract strategy, decide the sort of behaviour you wish to have on your contract. Do you wish to incentivise the contractor? Do you wish to have an incentive in time, cost or quality? Or do you want to not incentivise, i.e. put things like delay damages, retention um, or, or, or the like on the, on, on the contractor? So you have to decide the balance of, you know, how much do I believe in the incentivisation? Do I generally believe in it or do I think, now which ones will make the contractor work best? Which one would likely to produce the best outcomes? My experience is that incentives, incentives work better than disincentives. If you threaten somebody with damages, you know, if you don't finish on time, I will hit you for damages, you will create the wrong behaviour. You will create a defensive behaviour. In fact, you, they will turn that defence into aggression and actually come back after you for reasons to change the completion date. So we've done this forever, haven't we? And most contracts, in my opinion, they're written, they're written on the expectation on the basis of failure. We expect problems. We expect things to go wrong. And our contracts are written, if this goes wrong, if you do this wrong, if this, then this is how hard I'll hit you, which is a really strange concept. Why not set your contract up to succeed rather than, than to fail? So when you decide those four things, then reflect upon the, the array of contracts available to you, GCC, FIDIC, NEC, and pick the contract conditions that best matches, best matches the above. Don't just stumble into using a contract for the same career. And guess what NEC do? They offer you a huge amount of choice. There is a considerable amount of contracts that you can use. I'm not going to run through the name of these, just to illustrate the fact that there are contracts that allow you to buy um, goods, works or services. You can procure these on a one-off project, on a term project, via a framework. There are subcontracts, uh, even contracts for, for appointing these by gentlemen to actors, mediators, adjudicators, arbitrators, etc. Pick the contract that best suits where you are in the supply chain and what it is you want to buy. Okay, so there is an array of contracts. So my, my main point here, NEC4 is, is basically um, a, family of, a family of contracts and those contracts can be used to buy goods, works or services, any sector, in any country. Pick the one that's right for your particular project. So we have a lot of choice, don't we? A lot of choice on the contracts. Uh, within most of those contracts, if not all of them, you have some further choice. What would you like the pricing, uh, the, the, the payment mechanism to be? Would you like to pay on a lump sum basis? Would you like to pay on an open book cost reimbursable contract basis? Would you like to pay by a target cost? So we, we don't necessarily, well, we don't tell you what to do. We just offer those things up for you to decide what is best in the circumstances. But certainly what I find in Hong Kong, as in uh, as in a number of other countries, is a nervousness for things like open book contracting. They really want to use open book contracts. They really think that is a good way to combat all sorts of inefficiencies, lack of productivity, and hopefully also, get, you know, not that Hong Kong does much, but get rid of um, get, get rid of you know fraud and that sort of thing. So open book has to be a good way forward for getting you know for for improvement. But there's a nervousness and there's a, there's a skill that many people haven't got. How many people are well versed in the art of auditing, of, you know, of checking contractors' accounts and records, uh, those sorts of things. So there's a nervousness attached to using open book, cost reimbursable, stroke target cost contracts. Well, if you look at the definition of procurement, what we should be trying to do when we're procuring is align the objectives of the parties. So let's just think of buyer and seller, contractor and client. What does the contractor want out of the project? What does the client want out of the project? 
write those things down, work together to achieve each other's objectives. We might be in a good place then. So procurement is about aligning objectives. If you have things like a lump sum contract, are they truly aligned? Do you have a sort of a buyer and a seller sort of colliding into each other? One wants to pay less, one wants to be paid more. So not really aligned, but the target cost approach allows two people side by side, create that joint target, set out to work together to help the contractor beat the target and tap into the game. So the theory, the theory is good and it works in practice. So decide what you want to incentivize. What is important to you as a client? Is time of the essence? Is money the most important thing? Is quality the most important thing? You know, a lot of clients have said to me in the past, I want, I want a fabulous building tomorrow and pay nothing for it. OK, brilliant. So I will have time, cost, quality, you know, the, the, the iron thing, the, you know, the iron triangle. You have to, you cannot have something tomorrow for free at the highest quality. So what can you compromise? Is it time, cost or quality? What is most important to you? If you find out what is most important to the client, you can potentially incentivize the contractor to outperform the, the stated levels of performance in the contract. So you can use things like key performance indicators to target lesser use of, let's say, uh, electricity, non-carbon friendly resources once the, the building is in use. If time is of the essence, if you're a developer and time's absolutely the essence, have a significant bonus for an early completion. Each day they're early, they get a significant amount of money, which motivates the contractor to, to put time as the absolute number one sort of uh, parameter. So you can incentivize time, cost or quality, whichever, whichever you wish to, or have no incentives. Just say it's a fairly straightforward project. Here's what I'd like you to build or design and or build to this quality by this date. You don't have to in incentivize if you don't, if you don't need to or wish to. Uh, and the flip side of that is damages. Um, I, I've yet to work on a project where a contractor says, you know, I love it here in, in uh, Kowloon Bay so much so that I'm going to stick around for an extra six months. You know, it's a, it's a lovely place. Every contractor I've ever, ever worked with wants to get on and off project as quickly and safely as possible. So they're not motivated to, to uh, be in delay. So what, once they are in delay, particularly on something like a lump sum contract, they are losing money. They are losing the resources for the next job. They are losing money on the continued rental of, of accommodation for this particular job. To compound it, because they're late, we're now going to hit them for delay damages. So we're going to cause even more problems than we would otherwise do. Retention, we haven't fixed a hundred year old feature of construction contracts. Why do we need to hold retention just in case contractor doesn't come back and correct defects. In fact, why do we hold retention during the currency of the contract and let go half of it at completion? I, I've never rationalised that. What is the point of that? You may as well just hold retention in the very last month of the, of the construction project, which actually MT contracts allow you to do. You can actually have a retention free amount. Why do we start holding retention on day one of a two year contract? That seems crazy to me. So, so what I found a problem in the building industry is, is the continuation of a very traditional approach to procurement. Always having delay damages, always having uh, retention, always having a parent company guarantee, always having a performance bond, always having negative cash flow on the contractor. So you say, so why, why do you do that? Well, because we've always done it. Well, but the past doesn't necessarily you know, uh, give you an indication of what you should do in the future. And are you happy with the past? No, not really. Most jobs are full of disputes, full of unhappy instances. People are stressed and ill and unhappy outcomes. However, we get there, don't we? Because in Hong Kong in particular uh, is the most amazing array of buildings. Incredible. In a place the size of a postage stamp are some amazing buildings. So we, we've proven we can actually build fantastic buildings but we need to build it in, in, a, in a smarter way. Uh, less stress, more safe, more productive, more efficient. Uh, that's the waste. That's the waste that waste sits in, in our industry. Um, how would you like how would you like disputes to be dealt with? You can choose again in MEC contracts. You can choose if you want a sitting sort of dispute avoidance board, or you can choose to have to use the traditional well, uh, uh, the uh, 
option W1, it's called the norm, more normal routes, where you basically negotiate through um, senior representatives, and if you cannot reach a conclusion, which surely you, you must do, you hand over your dispute to other five people, adjudicators, arbitrators, or judges, who will decide the dispute for you, which personally I think is crazy. I would rather stay in control of my dispute and negotiate stroke mediate maybe as, as, as frequently as it could do. Again, there is choice. That's the point of this slide. There is choice for you in your building contract. But as an industry, particularly the building industry, are, do we all have the necessary skills to use a very modern day, uh, I think fairly simple form of contracting? Are we trained to do the right things? I wasn't trained to do any of the things I find myself doing now. My, my yeah, it, my, my surveying degree was in building and it was very, very traditional. It, it, it has given me next to nothing for, for modern day contract management. So we need people who are well, who are blessed with negotiation skills, who are able to get to the bottom of problems through mediation, who are good at preparing own value uh, analysis, EBA, who are good programmers. Today I've spent the afternoon being an independent program facilitator or something like that, you know. How many of us are really good at programming? How much of, of us are, are taught how to program or are well blessed in it? And what about soft skills? What about being a good listener, being being that good leader, um, being that you know, being that fine person? How many of us have got the right levels of soft skills to help us do our jobs properly? Uh, and I put tongue in cheek, possibly NEC accreditation. We, we think it's so important to learn uh, the contract and apply the contract correctly. We think that people should be accredited before they're actually let to, you know, let loose on contracts to act as project managers. So, you know, we think there are a significant and different skill set that people need to have in modern day contracting that most of us through our first degrees or early years, I don't think we, we have those. So I think there's a new set of skills to, uh, to, to gather up. So my, my plea to clients, strive to be that intelligent client, strive to be the best client in Hong Kong. What is the best client in Hong Kong? You know, classic leader. So, you know, they're, they're, they're clear of their, what they want of their objectives. They, they're good listeners. They're, they're, they're you know, real time decision makers. They're, they're nice people, they're honorable people. <coughs> they do their level best to pay as quickly as possible. In fact, why do we have negative cash flow? Why not start the contract off with positive cash flow? Why not seek a discount for a, you know, some positive, you know, I'll give you a quarter of money up front now, what, what discount can you give me from the target or lump sum? But why not strive to be the best clients in, in Hong Kong, be that incredibly intelligent clients. In turn, surround yourself with highly competent people. You know, I don't really, I don't really subscribe to modern day technical submissions, telling somebody just how good I am, sit me in a room, interview me. Put me to the test, ask different questions from different angles, see how I react. Surround yourself with highly competent people who, when push comes to shove, know that you can rely upon to do the job that they're paid to do. Write that great scope when you're writing a tender document. Um, <clears throat> absolutely critical is to write a really clear, comprehensive scope that articulates in as plain and clear English as you can do client requirements. How many of us are good at writing scopes? I am not. I am absolutely not good at writing a scope. What I'm good at is telling you how bad your scope is. What I'm not good at is writing it well in the first place. How many of us are blessed with skills to write, write those things? And another thing that we need to be trained upon. So I need to use you guys' help to a degree. They, they push you and pull you and prompt you to think about these things carefully. Do this, do not do this, is a structure. Uh, but we don't write the scope for you. We basically give you a blank piece of paper. Ultimately, if I were a, uh, a client, I would want highly professional tender documents. And I've probably seen this in building more often than, more often than civils, but the, the, for some reason, we just want to get on with it. We just want to award the contract and get on with it, sort it out later. It's a disaster. You know, um, only go to tender when you are um, happy that what you've produced as a tender document is highly professional. I would I would abandon the prepared by, reviewed by, checked by QA process and write a single statement, which is, I am professionally proud of this tender document. Can you imagine that? Who would sign up to that? Professional pride. Actually, it's rubbish. So don't send out rubbish tender documents. Um, choose some great tenderers. You know, how good is procurement in Hong Kong? 
probably just as just as bad as anywhere else really. We we haven't we don't progress in, in the world of procurement, do we? We still have this first past the post mentality. We talk about best value couple down. Do we really mean that? I still think we mean lowest cost. I still think in Hong Kong we genuinely mean lowest cost when we talk about uh, best value. Work with the very best contractors that you can do. Uh, improve your procurement routes. Ask the right questions at the right time. Do not let contractors onto the onto the list. If you're competitively bidding, don't let them on unless they satisfy certain criteria. You know, have you got an outstanding anti-slavery policy? Tell us about your well-being policy with your staff. Show us your payment records for you know mm -hmm. for your subcontractors. Tell us the amount of training days your operatives actually have. So tell me about your QA system. Don't do SA style questions. Mm -hmm. Find out who who, who you're. Uh, about to award a significant contract to for an, you know, an amazing amount of money for one, two or three years of people's lives. These are really important steps. I think we rush through this whole list in as quickly, as quick a time as we possibly can. This is, this is baking a cake, isn't it? If you throw any old ingredients in, just as like my cakes would look like, be rubbish, you know. Bake your cake carefully, select your recipe carefully, study it, then execute it. So I think I think what we need to do in construction, I'm a particular fan of ECI and two stage ECI in, uh, in ECC contracts. Um, I, to me, stage one is about using all your intelligence to set things up as well as you possibly can. Hit the button, which is the notice to proceed. Stage two, we drift into delivery mode. Just deliver it. Stop changing, stop messing around, deliver. Do all the intellect in stage one, do all the challenging, all your value, value engineering, all your whole life analysis, all the brilliance that we can bring to the table in stage one, deliver in stage two. And pick, ultimately pick a great contractor with a sensible price on the program. You pick yourself your lowest contractor, I guarantee you'll have problems. You know, absolutely inevitable. From day one, once the contractor realizes their price is too low, there, there'll be problems it be cause behavioral issues. So I did read about, I'm not sure if it will ever happen, but a government abandoning, if there were five tenders, throw the lowest one in the bin, throw the highest one in the bin, look at the middle three, find the medium, that's the right contractor. Who's brave enough to do that? Who, who's our intelligent client brave enough to do that? So what does good NEC contract management look like? Once we're in contract, so the previous one was getting into contract, this is in contract. What does it look like? Surely leave the scope alone, surely. Leave the scope alone. Uh, don't change it. If you change it, you've got problems. Uh, can I find this report? Keep trying. I, I read a report about some other governments of Canada some years ago. They found that when you introduce change after the contract was awarded, it cost three times what it would have cost had it been the original scope. Change is expensive, it disrupts. Do not do it unless it's absolute necessity. So have yourselves a challenging but realistic program, which we've been helping people do today. Join the only. This is our program. This is not something the contractor does to you. This is our program. Full of responsibilities, actions, and obligations of all of the parties. So let's get ourselves something which, you know, we're gonna to have to work hard. I don't mean working hard 20 hours a day, I mean work smart. Let's work smart to beat a challenging program. Let's have a clear communication plan. Let us not give verbal instructions or anything such silly. Let us have a good, high quality communication plan. Let us overuse the early warning process. So the whole approach here, which should be of considerable interest to building, is knowing as early as you can of a potential problem, even if it's the contractor's fault or the contractor's problem. They can remember that at all times, the contractor's spending your time and your money. So surely you want to help the contractor where they're spending your time and your money to spend less of your time and your money, even if it's the problems of their making. Focus on completion, focus on the final account. Um, we, all, we need to make sure that we understand the client is not uh, a bottomless pit of money. There's, there, there's you know, an agreed amount of money that's set in place for this particular project. N know if you, can, if you can change that or not. Let's focus on what the final account will be. Focus on what completion looks like. Uh, a focus on success. Um, in the contract, there's two clauses, 10.1, 10.2. First one tells us to do what the contract states we should do. We should do everything the contract tells you to do. Second one, we must act. 
in that spirit of mutual trust and cooperation. Humphrey Lloyd QC once said that's a strand of good faith. I'm not going to argue with Humphrey. Um, you guys might have the intellectual mind to argue with Humphrey. I'm not going to do that. But good faith, that's good enough for me. So we need to act in good faith. Do we do that at the World Threat? I don't think we do. Even in jurisdictions that demand we act in good faith, I still see us not acting in good faith. There are lots of things for us to learn. Like back to the soft side of things, isn't it? Um, and when it comes to compensation events, so I find there's a, a real draw and entity contracts to do with compensation events. Probably if you did a search of all the articles from all the, the, the learned people on the internet, you would probably find at least 90% to do with compensation events. We are infatuated with time and money via compensation events. We surely should be infatuated with amazing programs, amazing scopes, and overuse of the early warning process. If you get those three things right, we won't have any conversation events. For us, we don't get those three right, we end up with conversation events. So to me, the, the, the conversation event is, it, it's a problem in itself. And often it's a waste of clients' time and money. They often do not get good value from conversation events. They are merely compensating the contractor in time and money for an event the contract calls a conversation event. So we need, so I've made this up, we need things like three times more early warnings than we do conversation events. We need more early warnings to be notified by the project manager on behalf of the client. We need, we need to think and worry that little bit more about the future and de-risk the project and end up with less and less and less conversation events. So what we don't do in the world of NEC that the building industry likes us to do is adding things like professional sums and contingencies. So, and I used to do, I used to add these in into contracts, but what are they? They're, this is, sometimes we've run out of time, so we throw in some money because we've run out of time. Uh, and contingencies, I was told, you always add a contingency into a tender document, 5% for a building project, 10% for a civil engineering project. Why, why, why 5 and 10%? Well, because civil engineering is that bit more tricky, difficult, uncertain than building. But can anybody tell me where the 5 and the 10% have come from? Where is the data? to support the analysis of tender total to find the cap is 5% or 10%, it doesn't exist. One class I worked with had um, in civil engineering, uh, an uplift on average of, I think it was 27%. So five or 10% is completely misleading and means that your budget is completely wrong. Are there better ways of dealing with provisional sums of contingencies? You bet there are, but I dare say that'll come out of questions. I'm slightly overrunning my time. so. What we don't do, we don't allow you to wait and see. Well, I think probably in the building industry is we still like to wait until the job's finished and then go, thank goodness for that. And the day after, start talking about final accounts, which I think is a disaster, a complete disaster. Every business surely will be in a much better place if we have a real time approach to, to conversation events and to change. Don't do wait and see on your new projects. Uh, what we don't do, we don't leave everything to the contractor to do. This isn't a turnkey type set of conditions of contract. We expect the project manager to roll their sleeves up. We expect the supervisor to roll their sleeves up and the client. We expect them to work with the contractor for the good of the project. You will, what they say, reap what you sow, something like that. Is that right? You get out of it what you put into it. Put something into it, work with the contractor. Uh, there are, there is a bill of quantity, so lots of people say, oh, where's the bill of quantity? Well, there is one, an ECC option B or D, but is a bill of quantity really the future? So sure, I was taught how to measure things using a method of measurement, but you know, won't BIM change all that in future one? BIM be giving us things like some sort of bill of quantities, some sort of program that we use in the future. I think BIM will actually change a lot of the things that many of us were, were grudgingly, in my opinion, <laughs> Uh, trained to do. I, th I, don't, I don't see the bill of quantities as the future. I don't honestly see 20 years time that the bill of quantities is anything like, well, may not even exist, let alone be the most important document. The most important document will always be the scope followed by the program. Uh, they're the two most important deliverables. So finishing off very quickly, what is unique about buildings then? I, I don't know, I struggled, I'm asking questions. I cannot see what is so unique about buildings as opposed to any other sector. Other than, you know, there's a multiple of disciplines. I found that today in one project, multiple of stakeholders. So maybe attracts more stakeholders and more disciplines than, than others. And by different discipline, 
different, different disciplines often means fragmentation, which is not good. I, I would think on balance it's less, there is less risk in buildings than civil engineering, but it is complex because of stakeholders. Um, well, they're difficult to manage, but, but on all projects, all sectors, whenever you ever really had a really simple project that, that you've managed, do project managers help? I remember when I first started the building industry, we didn't have such a thing as a project manager. The architect was the manager, just like the civil engineer was the manager. And then the architect for me, sadly, stepped back and they took a step back and allowed these people called project managers to come through. So. Is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. Do, do project managers help? Project managers would say they do. Um, I don't know. Maybe the architects don't want to do that. Do an architect, what do you want to do that? Like I am PM too. I'm a project manager. What, what I think we're not very good at that we need to be better at is contract managers, which is not yeah. a profession. So we need to be much better at managing contracts than we are currently. Um, so I don't think a combination of project managers, architects, QS is actually manage the contract as well as they should do. It's imperative that you read the contract, understand the contract, follow the contract uh, at all times. So when it's about better management at all times, it's just about managing things better than you would otherwise do. Can anybody say they don't want that? You know, who, who doesn't want better management? Surely we all live for better management uh, unless you drive an income from disputes. Disputes are good you know, for, for those. So what I want ultimately in the building industry is an enjoyable but an amazing industry. We do some amazing projects, you know, assets, have a look out there, there's loads of them. But let's make it more enjoyable, more rewarding, more cost effective and, and improve the outcome. So anything about meta, better management, don't you strive for that. A lot of what we do out there is all about keeping society happy, healthy and safe. That's the infrastructure and the buildings, the assets. So I think we have a duty in our industry to make all of our assets as good as we good as we can. And I've repeated, but in fact, those two books should take out. Let's create an enjoyable but amazing industry, which I've repeated just for the sake of it. Uh, so what am I going to do? Oh, there's a fourth coming. Oops. Uh, oh, God. oh no, users group. Sorry, there is a fourth coming thing at the end. But have a look at the NEC users group. There's a special discount. Look at that, ten percent. I think it says. We are going to join. <laughs> you too. Have I yeah. convinced you? Yeah. Look at that. Fantastic. Yeah. Cash yeah. only tonight. Um, you know, come and create an amazing community of the world throughout. It works together to create amazing assets and great outcomes. Have a look at that. Anyway, or, or contact me. My details are somewhere. Yeah. And uh, and so thanks uh, thanks for our uh, for our first uh, very uh, very distinguished speaker uh, Rob uh, Rob and so uh, and so I wish to leave the, the time to our to our second sec section uh, to our to our other speaker uh, Mr Vin, uh, Mr Vincent Lee uh, and uh, and I will assure you we will have sufficient time for Q and A. Thank you very much, uh, um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I think uh, it is a very amazing experience for me to speak in front of an audience of more than 1800. So uh, let me see whether I am doing good or good in bad. Okay. So uh, because I have 25 uh, number slides to show, and I only got uh, 25 minutes. So uh, instead of saying something else, I go directly to my talk. So um, unlike Robert, um, who is very expert in uh, NEC, so I'm not going to show my or show off my limited knowledge in NEC. Instead, I will focus myself uh, on to one particular feature of the NEC 4, uh, which is talking about early contractor involvement and whether or not it is uh, possible for use this for using this uh, feature ECI for design build projects in Hong Kong. And uh, instead of uh, giving out a lot of answers, I think I'm going to um, show you two of my recent cases, these few cases, and then I'm going to ask a lot of questions for you to share, for you to think about, and also maybe for Robert to give me some answers, okay? Now, um, I pick up the topic of NEC, uh, the, the topic of ECI is because uh, I used to work as a civil engineer for many years before I turned myself into a barrister focusing myself on uh, dispute resolution uh, in construction projects. So I'm very interested to know 
uh, whether the implementation of ECI to help to um, no, the, um, whether or not the implementation of the NEC, particularly the feature of ECI, will help to um, eliminate or at least minimize some of the um, dispute that will come up uh, in, so, uh, in terms of design and build projects. So let's uh, first of all look at um, what do we mean by uh, ECI, which is provided an option, an optional clause, X22 in NEC4. And uh, it is recommended in NEC4 that uh, this clause is only used uh, for options C and D. So you get to have um, either cost reimbursement or you have to have a share in a of the gain of the, uh, the share of the pain. So according to NEC4, the procedures, as uh, Robert has just mentioned, uh, it basically will involve two stages. Stage one is the planning stage in which you set up a budget, you procure and select a contractor before the actual design of the works are fully developed and priced. And after that stage one planning, there will be a decision to be made by the client uh, whether or not he wants to proceed. If the decision is that the client wants to proceed, then there will be the stage two, uh, meaning that uh, apart from um, uh, based on the planning stage, um, the contractor will complete the remaining design and also uh, proceed to construct the works and what we call the deliverables. Now, according to um, I, 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 a couple of days from the website, official website of the NEC4, so what are those benefits um, in um, using this ECI? So there are six of them. Firstly, um, the benefit will be the integration of design and development and the construction planning at an early stage. And secondly, um, the use of ECI will um, encourage the use of a contractor construction expertise during the design stage, such that um, the buildability of the project will be ensured. So it is unlike the conventional one when you have a separate team of designer doing a design, uh, maybe without paying too much regard to whether or not uh, actually the design outcome will be actually um, very uh, will be very convenient or very practical to be built on site. The third advantage of using ECI will be the allowing opportunities to develop innovative solutions. So something that you cannot imagine if you are not uh, you are going to use the conventional design then build um, approach. Now, fourthly, uh, it is said that the benefit of using the ECI will be to allow more time for the planning and for preparation of the construction program. And fifthly, um, the use of ECI will mitigate project risk, especially you don't have the um, interface between design and construction because you integrate them together. You don't have any interface at all because it will be the same team who do the design or also to do the construction. And finally, it is said that the benefit of ECI will be to improve the cost certainty. Now, I'm not going to um, talk about that too much. And if you want to know how uh, ECI operates and also uh, what are those benefits that uh, you can achieve if you use ECI, you can go to the official website of the NEC4. Okay. Now, um, what about if we come? Uh, compare the ECI with the conventional design and build or design and build approach. Now it is said that for the conventional design and build or design and build, um, you have a very clearly defined scope of work. It is simple, fully designed and documented, sufficient time for design and procurement. But contrary to that, or in contrast to that, if you are using the ECI approach, it will be a fast track but you don't have a very well defined scope because you may uh, be involved in very complex design because you're talking about innovations. And also there may be a lot of unknowns and uh, there may be risk and also the time frame will be limited. Now, in fact, in Hong Kong, we do have successful implementation uh, of projects by using the CDI process. And this is uh, one that I can uh, I managed to get from the uh, NDC4 uh, website. Um, we are talking about the Hong Kong Academy, and we are talking about a value of uh, the project, uh, something like three six five million Hong Kong dollar or twenty eight million British pounds. So the start date is two thousand eleven, 
and the finish date is 2013. So we are talking just about uh, two years time, and then uh, we are talking about a very huge project, the Hong Kong Academy. And the contractor is Light Tunisia, and the project manager is Evans and Peck. Now, um, these are the comments um, from the participants in this project. The first one is that the ECC target cost option allow the contract to be signed and work to get underway on site while the design was still being completed. I think this is the essence of using the ECI process. The second comment, uh, the cooperative and target cost elements of the contract also allowed a range of design changes to be accommodated as the client is uh, um, in the requirements evolve during the duration of the project. The third comment is that transparency of the contractor in costs and application of changes allow the client to evaluate in real time if design changes could be afforded or needed to be adjusted. So this flexibility was important in many adjustments required to achieve a provisional beam plus platinum rating. Okay, so uh, in fact, um, this building is um, actually, I think, losing is very bad. Uh, so, so they achieved to get the beam plus platinum rating, okay? Now, my question is, um, we have said a lot of uh, good things about um, NDC4 and also ECI, and also how successful it has been in, in some of the projects in Hong Kong. Uh, the question is, can this ECI process be widely applied to, to ordinary design and build projects in Hong Kong? Now, let's look at the conventional thinking, okay? So, um, first of all, we have this publication by the uh, Hong Kong SAR government on the administrative procedures for use with the conditions of contract for design build contracts. So the comments by the Hong Kong SAR government is that in design and build contracts, the contractor is required to carry out the design to a predetermined extent and submit a tender, that is the contractor's proposal, based on the contractor's own design. Secondly, um, the DNP approach gives an advantage in some situation that, again, the word mutability. So that is the contractor expertise in construction methods actually can be relied upon even at the stage where the design process is being uh, developed. So it is introduced in the early stage of design and that designer and contractor are actually on the same team. So these are the um, so-called conventional thinking of why uh, it is justified to use a design build project, okay? Now, I also managed to find this uh, passage from the um, very authoritative construction law um, book, uh, Huxon Building and Engineering Contracts. The learned author of this book um, states in paragraph 3, hyphen 098, that in more traditional building or civil engineering situations, the justification for this system meaning design pre design I mean, advanced by its efficacy is that, in theory, it avoids duplication and the expense of design staff and enables the contractor with a special knowledge of their own techniques to design so as to produce maximum economy and therefore a keener price in a way that an architect or engineer without knowledge of their techniques would not. So with all due respect to the architect and engineer, uh, instead of having them sitting in the design room, coming up with some design. Uh, design build actually involve um, allocating the task of design at an early stage to the contractor, so that the contractor is actually responsible for design as well as construction. So uh, to achieve the target of what is set here, maximum economy and also kind price. Now, so, I have to show you some of my problems and see whether we can have some thought about whether or not we can use ECI on uh, ordinary um, projects in Hong Kong. Now, my first case, uh, actually these two cases are, um, the two dispute cases are handled by me recently. So, uh, in case one, it is uh, talking about a government project using NEC option A. So, uh, in fact, um, in the, um, Ordinary NEC free contract, you don't have the um, ECI clause. Although I understand that uh, after the publication of NEC free, the NEC actually um, 
publish a standard clause to be supplemented with NEC4. And then this N uh, ECI clause is also incorporated as a standard clause, optional clause in NEC4. Okay. Now, um, in this case, um, the employer uh, introduced some reference design, or you can call it a baseline design. And also, it incorporates some employer's requirement because in any C4, in any C3, we don't say client, we say employer, okay? Right. So, um, these two requirements, reference design and employer's requirement, actually form part of the works information. And they are provided for tender purpose. And the contractor are required to submit a tender based on this reference design and employer's requirement. And they are also have to submit together with the pricing document the technical proposals, including the schematic design of various structures, which also uh, form part of the works information. Now, later, when the tender was awarded, and uh, we find a um, successful tender, uh, at which become the contractor, during the construction stage, the contractor proceed to um, develop the design. And then at one stage, the contractor submit a design for approval by the project engineer. And also as required by the contract, they have to submit the design for approval by the relevant uh, government departments. And in that detailed design, the contractor depart or deviate from the schematic design submitted at the tender stage. They now propose to replace the original ball pilot scheme as shown in the reference design and also, and also as shown in the security design submitted at the tender stage. And they want to replace this operating scheme by a rock footing foundation, functional on soil. And the justification um, put forward by the contractor is that um, when they entered into the site, they did uh, some more site investigation and they found that the ground uh, conditions proved to be more favorable than it has been originally contemplated. But, um, you know, um, people always like conservative design in Hong Kong. So uh, the project manager and also the development government department, they all, the contract, all want the contractor to stick to the original uh, ball power foundation instead of a um, rock footing, uh, fountain on saw. So um, that uh, gives rise to dispute. The, the first dispute is that where the contractor is entitled to design the foundation works for the structures to be constructed under the contract, different from that shown in the weapon design, changing the power foundation shown in the weapon design to a rock foundation. That means a long powered foundation. This bill is number two. If the contractor design of the foundation is different from that shown in the contractor's technical proposal, submitted at the tender stage, whether that would invoke the operation of the contractual mechanism for the project manager to determine the associated saving in cost, if any, and to deduct the same from the prices. So actually, I was given the task to answer these two questions. But my questions today uh, is whether or not the use of the ECI process will help to be solved those disputes that I have just mentioned. Now, I raised some points for all of you to consider. The first one, is it likely or is it possible that, or is it a likely scenario that during the tender stage, the contractor already consider the use of a long power foundation instead of the poor power foundation as shown in the weapon design? But he just deliberately concealed his debt, his real intention, and then submit a schematic design based, based on the Bobal design and try to enter some low rate so as to increase the competitiveness of his tender. And then when he was about the tender, then he will propose to change the design from the Bobal one to a non power foundation. Now, my second point is, if we adopt the ECI, will this eliminate that kind of dispute? Now, my point is that if we are talking about um, 
a government project. So we are talking about in the context of a government project. If we adopt the ECI approach, so we are talking about you don't know actually what design you're talking about. Some tenderer may submit a proposal of uh, a broad foundation like this uh, contractor, or someone will stick to the original reference design, submit a formal design. So the employer will receive a lot of uh, different types of proposal. One is apple, one is uh, orange, one is banana. So how do you compare an apple with an orange and with an a banana? Uh, you know, um, in, in, in our day Hong Kong, especially the political environment, we are very sensitive to say that um, you have to have a very fair tender process and also a very, very fair tender evaluation mechanism. So you don't allocate too much discretion to the tender, to the one who is going to do the tender assessment. You don't give him too much uh, discretion because we are talk, talking about accountability and talking about public revenue. So you must have a basis um, for facilitating a comparison based on comparing apple to apple. So I, I guess if you are adopting the ECI approach, maybe uh, someone has to do the analysis or evaluation plan based on comparing an apple to an orange. So you have to overcome that kind of uh, issues. If you're talking about um, works in a public sector context. Now, my case two, which is even more interesting. So we are talking about a pipe rate building project. So um, of course, um, before this talk, we, we just have a chat with Robert. So mm. if I talk about superstructure, so um, we may be talking about something less risky than civil engineering project. But if you are talking about foundation of a building, because you're talking about underground works. So it also involves very great risk because you always encounter unforeseen ground conditions. Now let's see what happens in this uh, case. Now this case is a private building project and uh, I think Wilson will know. Many of the building projects in the private sector in Hong Kong, they will use the standard HKIA and HKIS form, which is uh, actually originated from a document published in 1986 and then which is amended in 1997 and 1999, I think because of the um, return of the sovereignty yeah. of Hong Kong back to China, and then you have to change the name RICS back to HKIS. It is a very similar comp. Yes, but I think it is, there's an updated version in 2006, mm -hmm. but in this particular project, um, we are talking about that um, old form, the private form. Now, for this project at the tender stage, um, the contractor or the tender was asked to submit two tenders. Tender A, uh, what we call the conforming tender, uh, the contractor is asked to submit a tender based on the design scheme uh, by the registered structural engineer. And this scheme was already approved by the building authority. And at this scheme, in that particular project, mainly consists of ball power funded on rock. Mm -hmm. So I think Wilson is very uh, familiar with that one because to save time, because of that um, pilot project, they got to be uh, approved by the building uh, authority. So um, it is also always a, a, a practice in the private sector for one conforming design to be designed first and then to be approved by, building, by the building authority. And the second tender, the tender is asked to um, submit is an alternative tender and it is based on a foundation scheme to be designed by the projector. So it is up to the tenderer whether they would focus on tender A or they would focus on tender B. Of course, the um, advantage of using this kind of procurement strategy is that uh, by allowing the contractor to um, submit a tender B, maybe the tenderer may submit more competitive tenders as what has been said by Hudson. Uh, based on their construction expertise um, and uh, they may come up with a design different from the conforming design but which is still technically visible and which may be cheaper than the uh, conformity design. Oh, faster. Faster, yes. Uh, in this project, um, actually it is the tender requirement that in both tender 
whether the contractor will adopt the formal de uh, formal design or they develop their own design, it will be the total responsibility of the contractor for the design and construction of the foundation works. And the contractor submit to tender, and the alternative that was um, more than twelve million Hong Kong dollar cheaper than the conforming one. And during the tender meeting, the contractor clarified that um, actually there would be not too much difference in between these two design, except that in the alternative design, the platform of doing the building work will be a bit different. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, they may have a steel platform. On the other hand, they may black film the excavation. Uh, from the old basement back to the ground level before they do the uh, party work. So um, ultimately, the contractor's alternative tender was accepted. And then, but um, the fact is that there were no details of the alternative design incorporated in the contract. In fact, at that time, the contractor was using the excuse that um, they are yet to develop the um, alternative design, so they can't provide too much details. Okay, so it, then it comes to the construction stage. And at the construction stage, the contractor completely abandoned the use of wall tiles. And again, the contractor managed to have its proposed rock foundation, which is also founded on rock, and without any piles at all. And this scheme is approved by the building authority. And, there, and thereafter, in the absence of any objections by the employer, and also uh, no objections by the consultant, no objection by the architect, no objection by the engineer, and also the QS, then the scheme was actually constructed. And in doing that, because if you are sticking to the pop out design, after you do the power, you still have to have a power pad. But by replacing the uh, pop out by a mass um, uh, reinforced rod footing, um, the employer even managed to omit the power cap. So it also served to help the employer to save the power cap, which is amount. Um, an amount more than 10 million Hong Kong dollar. So also a big saving to the employer as well. But still, dispute arises. The disputes are, the employer is of the opinion that the steel rock footing is a deviation from the original ball power design. So it is a variation. And therefore, um, the works have, the contract has to be adjusted, quite substantially done. But the contractor argued that because under the contract, he was responsible for the whole design. And therefore, he is fully entitled to adopt whatever design which was technically adequate and which could be approved by the building authority. And therefore, there should not be any adjustment at all of the contract sum. And in fact, in the contract, the contract sum was stated to be a lump sum contract. Okay, so this is the dispute. And I was asked to um, Sue on behalf of the contractor against the employer for this uh, dispute. Now, again, some questions for you to consider. Now, is it a likely scenario that, in fact, the contractor already thought of the idea of replacing the ball piles by the rock foundation, but it just chose not to mention that at the tenant stage? Now, the point is, if actually the contractor did think of this idea, what would happen if he mentioned that to the employer during the tender meeting? Would it be a possible scenario that that idea of using a much cheaper um, rough foundation in lieu of the proper foundation, that idea, would it be picked up by the employer and then the employer cancel this tendering exercise and be called a tender again? My third question here is that if we adopt the ECI process, will that help uh, to resolve this kind of dispute? Now, uh, Robert has talked about um, what is the difficulty of using uh, ECI or EC, uh, using ENEC4, not only in um, public projects in Hong Kong, but in private projects. Now, like the second example I have mentioned, I think um, we still are very used to the old adversarial um, culture uh, in the old form of um, uh, context of contract in Hong Kong. So um, we are too used to the adversarial culture. So we always think of how to say 
my my son's money and try to not to give so too much profit to the other side. So like the second example, um, the contractor is afraid of uh, his idea of using that block for digital being stolen, so to say, by the employer without being compensated for that. Inter I, I can say that it is an intellectual property. So I think the key success uh, to NEC4 is that not just because of the implementation of ECI, but overall speaking, I think the key element to success is that, first of all, we have to change our mentality. Because for people like my age, uh, doing so many projects in Hong Kong using the old context of contract, we are so used to the adversarial culture. So the, we have to get rid of those um, old ideas and to accept new culture and new ideas. And the second one is that I think we have to stick to the spirit of mutual trust and cooperation as uh, provided in the NEC 3 or NEC 4 in the very beginning of the contract. Otherwise, I think without this change of mentality, without this mutual trust and cooperation, uh, I think these are two important key elements for the successful implementation of NEC 3 and NEC 4 um, form of contract in Hong Kong. So that concludes my um, talk today. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks from uh, from uh, from Din, from Vincent's uh, Din, uh, interesting talk and uh, and sharing of this two, uh, of these two interesting cases to us. And so uh, and so right now we we, uh, we will have uh, we will have about thir uh, thirty minutes on uh, on uh, on the remaining Q and A sections. Uh, and uh, and I think we will uh, we already we have uh, we have received a lot of questions from uh, from the from the all from uh, from the audience, which uh, which will be attend uh, which will be attention to Rob because because Rob uh, Rob is uh, uh, is very experienced in uh, in uh, in, uh, in, in NEC three and N and NEC four for for all sort of uh, civil and during con uh, contracts. Uh, in uh, in Hong Kong, as well as the use of that uh, of any uh, con uh, contracts for for big for building works in uh, in the United King Kingdom, and so uh, and so I wish to seek for Rob's uh, expert views. Uh, uh, can can uh, can uh, can you advise us uh, what uh, what will what will be the essential points we uh, we can learn from uh, from the experience in uh, in UK uh, in uh, in uh, in terms of the use of NEC contracts and uh, and also the use of uh, uh, and uh, NEC con, uh, contracts for SIP or civil and uh, air dream uh, projects for private sector build, uh, building projects in Hong Kong in, fi uh, in, fi uh, in future if we wish to launch more uh, and, uh, and uh, NEC adop uh, uh, adoption uh, in the private sector? Uh, interesting question. Um, I look at it from different angles. So I think you, it's about attitude and mindset. The first thing to get right is the right attitude and the right mindset. You, you, th things have to change. So we, we have to learn how to uh, consistently be, uh, tell the truth and consistently work together to, to uh, get rid of problems. Um, are we well versed? Do we right, have the right attitude and mindset? I don't think we do. I don't think we do. So we, 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 you know the base of our industry is quite adversarial, so we have to change that over, don't we? But you know, but, but we're, it's very, we're full of intelligent people. I just think we misdirect our intelligence and pull it into non-value-adding activities. So, you know, I was dying to ask for both of the case studies. You know, what what does the work information actually say? What did they actually conclude here? What you know, why didn't they talk at ten to stage? Why do we competitively bid everything? Why do we think that gives us? A great outcome. Both of those are competitive bids, weren't they? Yeah, there's a network in it. Yeah, a more, more collective approach. I expect people to tell the truth. I want them to, to build things up responsibly, professionally, and tell it as it is at all stages. So I think we need a much better attitude and mindset. I think we need how to write much better tender documents. I think we need how to we learn how to need to learn how to choose better contractors to either ECI with or to competitively bid with. 
Um, I think we need to better understand the word, uh, the term best value. It isn't about lowest cost. Um, that's about it. I, th I think those things have been happening in, in, in the UK. I'm not saying the UK is perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, you know, I think frameworks have helped a lot with, with the UK. I would love to see frameworks used more here. Long term relationships between a client and a group of consultants, small group of consultants, small group of contractors who work together and improve, you know, behaviour, communications, and ultimately uh, outcomes. I, I'm not a fan of competitive bidding. To me, just rewards the contractor makes the biggest mistake with the job, which is pretty disastrous. Mm -hmm. Who will do what they've done in both of those scenarios? Who will try to, to defend? in some way the further erosion of, of, of the very nominal profit margins they probably have got in, in the contracts. I would love us in, in ECI to talk about you know um, using project bank accounts, about KPIs, about about you know, zero carbon, about uh, advanced advanced payments. You know what why are we always talking about negative things? Why can't we talk about positive things will actually make a difference. All we're going to do with our is just perpetuate those, those, those same old things that we discussed for over in the day, perhaps not actually change the industry. Perhaps a, uh, a type of prog sharing or value sharing or program sharing. Yeah, yeah. Why, why, why not? So, so find out what is important to a contractor. And surely it's, it's, it isn't just about profit and cash flow, it's about you know, certainty of work going forward. But they do want a reasonable profit and they do want a reasonable cash flow. Why do we push contractor into immediate and negative cash flow? It, it's irrational to me. Mm -hmm. and, and many, many clients seem to think that contractors are good at mind reading and good at fortune telling. They're not, <laughs> not in my experience. And if they did, tell me the lottery numbers for the weekend and I can retire. Sorry, no. Wilson, not anytime soon. So, um, Common, yeah. It's no answer, it's a combination of things, but, but it's about improving, particularly the attitude and mindset. Yeah. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks Robert for, for, your, uh, for your sharing on, uh, on the first question. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, for, uh, and for the second question, I just wish to raise to Vincent because, uh, because, uh, because he had put, for, uh, put, for, put forward two, uh, two, in, uh, two interesting and uh, NEC core track case. And, and I thought the, uh, the, uh, the, the essence is on, uh, is on whether there, uh, there was mutual trust and whether the uh, in the contract there is a fair terms for for private share uh, share uh, sharing no uh, no matter in any C4 in terms of e in terms of ECI or or uh, or, e or even a, spe a specifically written clause for for pro for private sharing be, uh, between the employer and the contractor and the tenderer and and so uh, and uh, and so on uh, on uh, on this basis I uh, I wish to go a bit fur uh, fur uh, further mm. because because right now uh, in uh, in terms of the adoption of uh, of NEC con contracts or people people building work I know the uh, in uh, the leader right now, or uh, or uh, is uh, is in the public sector, uh, is in the public sector, and uh, and the architectural ser uh, services the uh, department had had launched uh, a uh, quite a large number a number, a number of projects with uh, with uh, with N with NEC adoption, and and I and I just wish to seek for the views of from uh, from Vincent. Uh, can you share? Can you share with us how you think uh, it uh, it can be even a uh, a more wider adoption of uh, of uh, of N of N uh, of con contracts for the prop for the proper set sector, say uh, say in the Hong Kong Housing Authority, or for the NGO, say uh, say uh, say the Hospital Authority, etc. Now, uh, I think uh, Robert will agree with me that uh, the Hong Kong government is the uh, pioneer in using the NEC form of contract um, in the public sector. Mm -hmm. And in fact, for civil engineering projects in Hong Kong, uh, no doubt that the Hong Kong government is the uh, largest employer uh, in embarking upon uh, public uh, projects. Mm -hmm. So um, now they, we already had a lot of uh, people uh, undergoing, undergoing training uh, in NEC. And uh, it is widely used, as you have mentioned, uh, in 
there is civil engineering project as well as building projects in the public sector. And I can see the trend that um, the NEC is also widely used in the public corporation as well. And I, I, I come to know that uh, the MTRC, they are now planning um, and also designing the uh, second Dongzhou station. Yeah, 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 no, no. And they are going to use the NEC uh, contract as well. And I think the next candidate may be um, the airport authority, although I, I'm not sure whether the um, I think the third one maybe they are not good. They are not. I don't they know whether they are using the NEC. They are using. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So this is another example of um, public corporation mm -hmm. uh, using NEC uh, as well. And I cannot think of any. Um, I, I don't know any uh, example from the hospital author hospital authority. But for sure, I think the trend is that um, many of the government project, as well as many of the project by the public corporations, uh, is actually actually. Um, uh, uh, sticking to the trend of using NEC. But the difficulty I think is uh, whether it can be more widely used in some public building project like the one I, I'm talking about. Because in that, um, say you are talking about one or two buildings in a very confined site in the, um, in the uh, urban district. Um, those developers, they are always emphasizing on profit. Mm -hmm. They don't want to share their profit with you. So they always want to have the most competitive price for the contractor. And that's the case I'm talking about. Even the contractor try to um, give up a, a, a proposed scheme, which actually I have to save the power cap as well. But this employee is still trying, is still trying to seek for further uh, deduction of money yeah. from the contract because Maybe the employer is envious of the huge profit that is enjoyed by the contractor by replacing the uh, <coughs> profile design by the uh, 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 from funding foundation. So I think for that sort of ordinary small size private building project, we really have to have a, um, a change of mentality and also more emphasize on the uh, mutual trust and cooperation. Like Robert has said, um, you want to achieve things. You don't, you don't want to achieve things by penalizing people. Mm -hmm. You want to achieve things by offering incentive. Mm -hmm. So I think um, it takes time and also it, uh, I think it um, needs to have a lot of training to change the mentality of the uh, those particular set of the construction industry. Yeah, yeah, I, I think uh, I think I personally I also agree with the views of from uh, from uh, from Vincent uh, and uh, and I can see that uh, there is an another very very interesting que uh, question which is uh, directed to Rob uh, to uh, to Rob uh, to Rob but I uh, I just wish to read it through. Uh, he said my question is to is to Robert and I'm now reading your book in NEC for practical solutions which is very pra practical and easy to understand. Will you write more NEC guidebook or recommend us some good reference books? Thank you. What a fantastic person. <laughs> it is yeah. a very good quote. Well, well, that's quite funny. So yeah, of course I'll write you a book personally. But uh, yeah, I've got two books being written at the moment. Mm -hmm. What what's this space? For, um, what's this space? One is about what, why NEC is why NEC is needed mm -hmm. and what problems it's fixing. And the next is using an NEC in the world of utopia. If you like, <laughs> when we all le learn to act openly and honestly, like good. Uh, human beings, how, how much, how much better we could be. But yeah, uh, but yeah I'll, I'll respond to that in. I'll, I'll do some notes of some of the good reference books. Okay, okay. But well, that's very kind of that. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. yeah. Uh, and uh, and uh, and I also see uh, and uh, and other in uh, interesting que uh, question which mentioned that <coughs> the building contract is generally has two has two two types. Uh, with con with quantity and uh, and without con uh, and without con con quantity yeah. uh, for without quantity so, uh, it will be based on drawing and spec and specification yeah. and so uh, which NEC four option could you uh, could you play the role for building without quantity I think BQ, BQ. Uh, with uh, without uh, without uh, without B, uh, without BQ option. Uh, right, so she we talk about one particular contract, which is the engineering and construction contract, the ECC, there were six main options 
A, B, C, yeah. D, or F, E, or F. Two of them feature bill of quantities. One of them uses a bill of quantities to create the, a, a target, so it's a target cost contract. The other option B is a classic sort of measure and value bill of quantities. There is no lump sum no as such, it's remeasurable. So you measure and value the works according to that which the, the scope asks for. So I think I think it's not BQ with quantity. It's I think it's, it's I think it's lump sum with or without quantities. I think that's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. So if you want a lump sum without quantities, you can use option A. That's exactly what it is. If there is no lump sum with quantities, there's a remeasure contract, re which is B, which is a, a little bit like um, what JCT with the proximate quantities is what I can think yeah. of. So it's approximate quantities rather than guarantee that they'll be, that they'll be fixed. So they're the two, option A or option B. Yeah. But we don't strictly have a lump sum with quantities. And the problem with the lump sum with quantities are that quantities are always wrong. So you think got an argument. Sometimes, yeah, I mean, always in my experience, right? And, and then you've got an argument about, well, who takes the risk of erroneous yeah, because, quantities? Because, because, uh, because I relied on them. Because, uh, yeah. because the, sometimes the, uh, the design may not be totally, totally so complete. So you can't have quantities yeah. then. So uh, what I, what I, I'm not a fan of the tool of the quantities, but what I did like them for in the past is proving that the design is finished. Mm -hmm. Because if you can't measure it, you can't build it. If you can't build it, you can't go to tender yet. Because if you're using a standard form method of measurement, mm -hmm. you have to complete the design in order for you to prepare a bill of quantities. So the best thing a bill of quantities has ever done, in my opinion, is test the completeness of the design. Mm -hmm. So so I am somebody somewhere has to quantify, even though mm -hmm. using perhaps a target cost contract or even a lump sum contract, somebody somewhere has to say you need 10,000 square meters of this, 500 doors, you have to quantify. Yeah. But contractors quants, if you like, for a design and build job uh, are uh, different to those that are prescribed in the standard form method of measurement. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Robert, for, for your uh, for uh, for your for your expert sharing on on uh, on different types of uh, of a of NEC op, uh, options and uh, and uh, and contractor use. Uh, and right now, I uh, I see a very a very interesting que uh, question, which is uh, which is related to BIM and uh, and technologies and uh, and. Uh, and I would just wish to uh, to uh, to read through and see uh, and see if uh, if Robert or Vincent may uh, may wish to share to share your views and uh, and personally I am also an accredited an accredited BIM um, manager as well. Uh, the question is uh, is like this: I think BIM is dry technologies code and NEC is wet human code. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and if part and if we apply both to both together, can better drive collaboration. Since BIM provides CDE or platform tools to facilitate collaboration, while NEC emphasizes on human behavior, for example, mutual trust and collaboration. Do you have any, do you have any comments on these and how NEC can further evolve and integrate with BIM or ISO 19650, which is a new standard of BIM as well as digitalization and the like? Well, what a question. Uh, so wet human code is NEC, so I like that. How, how can NEC further involve and integrate with BIM? Well, what a question that is. That's a fantastic <laughs> question. So the, the human race, we're like dinosaurs, the human race, and we, we're just so slow to evolve. Yet in the world of technology, with BIM especially, there's some amazing transformations, leaps and bounds, leaps and bounds. But getting getting the human race to act in the spirit of mutual trust and cooperation is hard work, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Really hard work. So I don't think the human race is caught up with where NEC expects us to be. Mm -hmm. If we push that bar up even more, we might lose people. Mm -hmm. But very interestingly, so so we're prepared to embrace technology change mm -hmm. and the transformation that's bringing. We don't seem to be prepared to embrace the cultural change that the human behaviour side of things. I, I think we're way off the pace of where we need to be. But nobody I know the world throughout is actually using the NEC contract exactly as prescribed. Nobody is doing it.
we, we all have reservations, fears, concerns. We all have an inbuilt DNA profile that says, oh, no, don't say that or don't do that. So it, I, I'd be interested to find out where this person thinks we, we could go to help further the integration of BIM and NEC. But, but I think a real challenge is getting people up to the level of that mutual trust and cooperation yeah. to, to, you know, in, in the first place. Um, it, it, it's, it's just interesting, isn't it? We, we, we unquestionably, we don't, we don't challenge the latest release of iPhones or whatever, <laughs> or realise the brilliance it is we've been. But when I stand in the room and say, you need to know about an early warning and tell the truth and give your opinions to how you might solve it, we hesitate. We don't do that. Why don't we do that? I can't, I can't, I'm not a psychologist, so no. I, I observe human behaviour, don't understand human behaviour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and Vincent, do you have that? Do you have that? I know you know more than me in terms of the I am, but I think um, NEC, uh, as far as I understand, is uh, sort of um, very open-minded uh, form of contract. So. <clears throat> you can incorporate all those essential costs and then you can pick up those optional clauses that you wish to uh, incorporate. Mm -hmm. And um, like the disproven solution clause, you just, you just have, um, you just insert uh, whatever you like, like Robert has said, a uh, dispute avoidance spot, or mm -hmm. you want to introduce the mediation, adjudication and then arbitration. So I don't think uh, it is the necess necessity that um, this kind of um, EIM or ISO so and so they should be mutually exclusive uh, yeah. with the use of uh, yeah. NEC4. Mm -hmm. I would think the two can be combined together. Yeah, yeah, sure. There should not be any problem. Yeah, I think uh, I think I uh, I totally agree with uh, with uh, with, Rob, with Robert and uh, and also Vincent's work views and uh, and I wish to share a little bit for, uh, for, uh, further because because uh, because NEC for for contracts it's uh, it's in fact it is a very flag flag uh, flag flexible approach of, uh, uh, of, uh, of contractual arrangement and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and it rests in the roots of uh, mu mutual trust and mutual collab collaboration be, uh, between parties. Uh, and, uh, and if we are going to adopt BIM, which is, uh, which is, thought, which is also a tool uh, and, uh, and a model and, and a methodology, which, uh, which also rely on collab collab collaborations be, uh, be, uh, um, among the project team, the design team, as well as well as the call, as well as the call, as well as the a contractor uh, in construction stage, and so uh, and so, I think it uh, it can uh, it can work very well. Yes. Yeah, and uh, and uh, and as we can show, uh, seen in uh, in many gov uh, in many gov uh, government contracts right now, lead by different bureau. And so, I wish to go go to one more one more quite uh, one more question here. I think it should be from a call, from a, from a QS or a call or a contract ma uh, ma uh, manager. I just wish to uh, say it out. You mentioned that in NEC we don't recommend you uh, using provisional sum and contingencies. However, we normally we rely on the contingencies to act as an reassurance. Uh, should any VO or claim ser uh, services? So, can we realistically be con confident enough to not allow provisional sum or contingencies with NEC contract? Uh, civil and en civil engineer may still ser service and their compensation uh, and their they compensation and their compensation service. event. Uh, and uh, by uh, by the provisional sum and contingencies are, uh, allowed, is there any suggestion or, or or alternative to convince the client of not uh, needing provisional sum or contingencies? And so, uh, yeah. well, uh, I leave it to Robert and Vincent on, uh, on my two sides. Okay, so with, with, instead of a provisional sum. Um, if something is likely, most likely, we most likely need a retaining wall, for example, mm -hmm. put your sensible assumptions into the scope. Say that yeah. we want a retaining wall, it's this long, it's this high, it's this finish. We may not have that finish, it may be something else, but put what your expectations you're in the scope. In the scope. Yeah. Get the contractor price and program on it. Mm -hmm. If it turns out that you want red facing brickwork instead of blue facing brickwork, then it's an easy replacement by an instruction. 
So I think what's wrong is to say we want to allow a professional sum of a million dollars for a retaining wall. Well, where will the retaining wall be? What size will it be? You know, when might you decide if you want it or not? So if you, if you, if there is a highly likely chance that you will want it, put some sensible assumptions in the scope, then you only need to change. You could even put a sketch, hand draw a sketch, put that into the scope, no problem. Um, so. And if it is such a substantial amount of work that you're not sure about, then delay tendering if it is so substantial. But what are we expecting the contractor to price and program on with this professional sum? It creates just a massive uncertainty. And the, on the contingency, you, you must hold a contingency. So all I'm saying is don't just randomly put 5 or 10% in as a contingency. Separately have your risk register that should have been created around about conception and inception stages of a project. Start looking at risk, at threats and opportunities. Start trying to avoid, reduce and mitigate in those threats as best you possibly can. When it comes to the tender period, decide who owns those threats that you've been, a been unable to avoid, reduce and mitigate. Call that residual, residual risk. If that residual risk is the contractor, make sure your contract says that and, and it's up for them to allow in terms of time and money. Where those residual risks are the clients, which we would normally put into contingencies, then, then make sure, again, your contract allocates such risks to the client and make sure they hold a sensible sum in respect of the risk that they hold on, under the contract, which could be far more or far less than the random 10%. I'm just mm -hmm. trying to tease people away from the random 5 or 10%, which is unsupported by any statistics, and to encourage people to use a risk-based method of, of deciding how best to avoid reduce mitigate um, risks and who takes the responsibility of what risks and if it is the client then have an appropriate amount of contingency within the overall budget to draw upon to use in the contract by conversation events. So thanks, uh, thanks Rob, uh, Rob a lot and, uh, and I wish to know if, uh, if Vincent, you, if, uh, if you have any views. If you uh, if no, uh, maybe I think I would time, uh, time, time. Uh, because uh, because of the time I I uh, I need to go to go to two more uh, two more slides yeah which is the uh, which is the QR code uh, uh, this uh, this uh, this slide is uh, is regarding the evaluation survey uh, and I just wish to uh, re to re to remind all our colleagues and friends uh, and ladies and Jack and Jack and gentlemen you 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 need to go to go to the web link or use this QR code to uh, to uh, to input your in your in your English name and your and your and your e and your email address to the Q and A before before you give uh, you will get your ele electronic copy of your CPD cert which will be one one point five hours and remember to put your in your English name and your and your email address and uh, and uh, and as the last part of this uh, of this uh, very uh, very good and uh, and very check and very challenging and uh, and uh, and uh, and meaningful web uh, webinar to, to uh, today on NEC for uh, call uh, call tracks for building works and I wish to announce we are uh, we uh, we will have our next NEC uh, talk uh, the uh, the title is uh, is a very interesting one which is synchronizing mediation skills to the mechanism of dispute resolution under NEC 4 before embarking upon a reserve serial or alternatives a perfect match uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, very interesting NEC 4 talk uh, is also co-organized co by uh, by construction in uh, industry car uh, car uh, council, the School of Professional uh, and uh, Development and con uh, and Construction and uh, NEC A uh, Asia, as well as the Hong Kong Mediation car Council. And uh, and the day is the twenty second of March two o two one. And uh, and I hope you all will uh, will uh, will enroll online and uh, and uh, and thank you very uh, very uh, very much because to because to because today we have one thousand and eight hundred. 
P, uh, people who have enrolled and thank and thank you so much and see you in the next sam seminar on the 22nd of march and thanks and thanks robert thank and thanks vincent again and thanks cr and thanks crc and neca and and and, and, and all of you okay thanks thank you bye bye, okay. bye, -bye.